Hello and welcome to the Joe's Art History Podcast, a podcast which celebrates all things art historical every single day. On today's podcast, I sit down with Yachu Yang, who is an antiques jeweller and dealer based in London, and she runs the company called Clark and Yang Fine Antique Jewellery. It was established in 2020 and I felt there was no one better really to have this conversation as not only is Yachu incredibly knowledgeable but she's also a very good friend of mine and this was a really exciting and special episode to sit down and record with her. On today's podcast we delve into the history of pearls by looking at Charles I's pearl earring, an item which was incredibly important to the king since he was given it at the age of 15. For him, it was a true statement piece and really said something about his character and allowed him to portray himself as this very fashionable, elegant gentleman. And it was also just a way, really, of showing just how wealthy he was. And it was a piece that he completely adored and which he not only wore for his entire life, he even famously wore it to his execution. Now, of course, the story doesn't end there, but we'll get into that a little bit later in the podcast. We also take you on a whistle-stop tour through one of art history's most famous paintings that contain a pearl, Vermeer's Girl with a Pearl Earring. And then we talk about, just as a little extra treat for you all, two pearls which came to auction within the last decade, which not only have an incredible history, but both set auction records. This is an incredibly interesting chat and I really do hope you enjoy it and learn a little something. I know I certainly did. So this conversation kind of came about, Yachu, because you had actually written an article when you worked for a jewellers in London about this incredible painting of Charles I, King of England. It's three different angles of the king. But one of the sort of standout things about this portrait is the pearl earring that the king is wearing. Yes. So King Charles I was actually a very interesting character. He was such a big art collector and he was always into fashion. He always he was known for spending a lot of money for like really amazing fabrics so he could wear really, you know, represent his monarchy, his power, his you know, like his taste um in a way. And he's been wearing that pearl of a earring since um when he was fifteen and I feel like that's something you know, it's such a big part of his life. His fashion um, style, he's he's never actually appeared in public without his pearl earring. He even wore the pearl earring, actually, when he went to his execution. So it was such a massive part, actually. Yeah, it's so interesting, actually. And it's, it's something that it's not horrendously obvious that it's there. But once you notice it and then you go back over portraits of King Charles I, it's something that you're kind of, it's in every single one, like you said, sort of hidden in plain sight almost one of one of these things and when you go back you can't help but see it everywhere yeah and it's it's part of his fashion style almost isn't it yeah no absolutely I thought it would be interesting actually to talk a little bit about sort of the history of pearls because there are these things I think today um you know we're in our early 30s this is something that we wouldn't particularly go out and buy a pearl but when King Charles I was on the throne they were incredibly popular yeah um so it's actually pearls are the uh, personally I think pearls are the most amazing gemstone because they can naturally you don't actually need to polish anything like how you polish diamonds sapphires or anything you it literally comes as it is and you know obviously it's beautiful for its iridescence that's the beauty of it before 19th century really pearls they were so rare they were so scarce they were definitely more expensive than diamonds a, a lot more unusual uncommon rare than diamonds I mean this is the kind of thing that actually dating back to you know the earliest pearl could be dating back from 15,000 BC first gemstones that's ever worn by human that's pearl wow yeah i think for me i didn't actually really look at pearls as a gemstone i don't i don't know what what i thought they were but they they are classed as a gemstone yeah they are they are the what people consider organic gemstone um because they come from natural resources i mean every gemstone come from natural resources but they come from the kind of actual living life uh, pearls actually come from an oyster and in able to get them but in history you have, the fishermen will actually need to dive into uh ocean somewhere really deep to find an oyster and actually to open it up and it's not every oyster could have 
have um, a pill. <laughs> so, yeah. I read somewhere that they seem to think it's one in every 10,000 oyster that has a pearl. But again, it doesn't necessarily mean that the size is as big as what Charles the first earring is. It's quite a, a substantial size. What I didn't know is that there are two different types of pearls. Yes. So there is one type, it's natural pearl, which is what King Charles I was wearing in every single of his portrait. And there's another type, which is a lot more common, and most people probably owned it, um, is cultural pearls. And the difference is, yeah, natural pearl is actually extremely rare. It's so difficult to find. It was so, it was actually something only for royalties or extremely wealthy people. And cultural pearl was actually introduced in 19th century. And, you know, you can massively produce them. You can see pearl farms and you can get everywhere else, uh, well, everywhere in the world now, actually. Yeah, it's, it's a really, really interesting history. So essentially, so a, a pearl is formed when sand or some sort of molecule enters an oyster. And it's actually, it's a protection mechanism, actually, because the oyster thinks, oh, something's invaded and they form this covering over this piece of sand or the molecule that's entered yeah which is actually you have like layers of then sort of goes around because you know that's the way how oyster you know they in order to survive it's, it's like injury i think you will have some kind of like liquid or, or anything from your body just to protect you yeah which is so so interesting i i, I had never really thought of how a pearl Forms and it can take anything it can take years for a pearl to form yes and i mean it's quite uncomfortable if you think about it you have some kind of i mean for pearls for oysters it must be a very uncomfortable experience because you actually you need to it's like you you grow a stone inside you that kind mm. of thing but that's how we get beautiful pearls now oh yeah that's it and the whole idea of a is it a cultivated pearl so cultural pearl uh, any kind of pearl with human interaction so essentially people open up the the shell and uh, stick something in and just to create that kind of in, um, irritation to trick the oyster, oyster to actually understand they need to create some kind of layer to protect themselves you know you use the same logic but with human interaction i think that is so so interesting but so the pearl that we're talking about here so charles the first like we said already it's this it was this sort of staple piece in charles's wardrobe he was this very eccentric dresser and spent a lot of money on looking good but it actually kind of contrasted with like the king himself he was actually quite a shy person he was and i think he was known for being very short i mean he was not the the, the fittest guy you know in the crowd or anything so he was always i think to him wearing that kind of like massive pearl earring kind of gave him the power and confidence in a way yeah no absolutely and this is at a time when you know, kings had the divine right of God on earth. People looked to the king as essentially a, a god amongst men. King Charles I is the only monarch in British history ever to be beheaded. And like you said very briefly, he actually wore the pearl earring when he was executed. Yes, and because and, I think his idea was probably he's going to want that pearl with him and he kind of like took it to heaven with him. Well, I'm not entirely sure, but I think that's probably something he had in his mind and later after his execution people actually removed it uh, from his ear and gave it to his oldest daughter um so that was i mean it's sad but incredible how much he loved that pearl yeah. earring one of his last wishes was that, the, that his pearl earring would go to his daughter but the story doesn't really end there with this pearl do we know anything about where it is now Yachu, or who who it ended up yeah with? ever since the pearl earring went back to his oldest daughter um he actually stayed in a family ever since then and it is in a private collection and that's owned by duke of portland in Nottinghamshire right now. I think a few years ago VNA did an exhibition to show this amazing, amazing um, pearl earring. And that was a few years ago. And that was, I think that was probably the last time that's um, on public for people to see. Yeah, it's just amazing, actually. And he just has it in his home. And like you said, in Nottinghamshire, it's, it's this beautiful, um, almost sort of teardrop shape. Pearl. Yeah. And you have a kind of like little crown um, ornaments, carving, the, you know, like carving ornaments on the top of the pearl, just to um, emphasize the power of the throne. That's quite interesting. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's just this incredible, incredible thing. And just very briefly for everyone listening, all the images and artefacts that we refer to throughout this podcast will be available to view 
either via my Instagram page or on my website and I'll have links to both of those in the show notes below. Like, like we said previously, it's one of these things, it's kind of like a hidden gem within art history. You notice it on this incredible three-angle portrait that Anthony Van Eyck made of the King. And if anyone is London-based or has been to the National Gallery, there's an incredible equestrian portrait that's just been re-unveiled after extensive conservation work. And it's King Charles I on horseback. It depicts him riding off into battle, wearing the earring. It's just unbelievable. Yeah, it's like every, almost every single portrait of him, you can see him wearing that pearl earring. It's just... And you can see, like, King Charles I, when he was 15 years old, he's, like, the first ever grown-up-ish portrait. He already had it on, and it was massive right next to his little face. <laughs> well, that's it. <laughs> he really wasn't this this tall guy. He was round about 5 foot 2, 5 foot 3. So it really was, you know, sort of dressing to elevate his status by by his objects it's really really incredible yeah gosh yeah but I think art historically wise it's not the most famous pearl I think we couldn't really do a podcast on the history of Charles I pearl without talking about another painting which I think universally is just you probably don't know the artist but you'll definitely know it sort of visually to look at and that of course is Johannes Vermeer's Girl with the Pearl Earring. Yeah, that was, uh, that's the Mona Lisa in um, Netherlands, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the Mona Lisa of the North. <laughs> For anyone that doesn't know what this portrait looks like, it's a, a very intimate scene of a young girl just casually sort of looking behind her. And she has on this incredible blue and gold head scarf. And she's wearing a very plain sort of brown smock. But the standout piece, and there's, there's, it's really not a lot of detail yet, actually. I don't know if you if you would agree, but it's just a flicker of a suggestion. Yeah, because wasn't of, she a maid before? It's something like this. I mean, historians don't really know who she was, they're, they're, and there's no there's no mm. record. But it's just a very sort of light suggestion of this pearl earring, and as she stands against this very dark background. Oh, it's so striking that but pearl. This, it's massive, and um, yeah, it's incredible. Well, that's it. And Vermeer is quite an interesting character because there's only about, so reading for this, it's it's kind of, div- people are divided. It's between sort of 34 and 36 paintings. That's all we have of Vermeer's work that are 100% attributed to this artist. But like you just said there, this pearl is absolutely massive. So as a gemologist, <laughs> Yachu, and going on what we've said with um, Charles the first having this enormous wealth on, on, and being able to afford something like this, humble painter Johannes Vermeer, what are the chances that this peril is real? Uh, well, I mean, it's so difficult to know because just by looking at the painting, you can't really tell whether it's that's an, an actual, a real pearl or not. But I will say the size, it's actually, it's not smaller than King Charles the first pearl earring, if you see what I mean. It's actually pretty much the same size or bigger yes humongous and and (laughs) essentially i mean in in history pearls with this kind of size usually only go to one place for your family you know the the wealthiest men or people who own the most power really i honestly i i can't say (laughs) it's something that i've never really contemplated before actually and it was only in doing the research for this podcast that i that i've kind of looked into a wee bit and like we've said like for me and this painting so little is really truly known about it but what historians seem to think is that it's fake yeah and um really for that kind of era um you know when the the painting was done for somebody who who was able to own this um pearl of earring will be extremely extremely wealthy so yeah the chances are i i have to say probably quite small for this to be yeah. real <laughs> So earlier in the 16th century, there was a bit of a fashion in Venice where people would make imitation pearls for women to wear. Because like you said previously, these were incredibly expensive and they still are today. Natural pearls, incredibly expensive, very, very rare. And there was this fashion in the 16th century where people wanted to wear them. So in Venice, they developed this method where they would make these fake earrings and necklaces from blown glass or metal. And they were painted to give it this sort of very pearly matte finish that you see here in the earring, um, which I just think is so interesting. You know, at the time when this was painted, so 1665, pearls were all the rage in the Netherlands where Vermeer was painting. And 
there's actually, like, like we said earlier, you know, there's a very small number of paintings, art historically wise, that are sort of solidly confirmed as being by Vermeer's hand. And in 18 of these 36 paintings, Vermeer includes pearls in some way or another, which is something, a detail that I, again, kind of like Charles the first pearl earring, I had never really noticed before. And when I've kind of gone back over things in preparation for the podcast, it's something that I can't really believe how many times he did Exactly. And it's, um, it's the same massive um, size. Yeah, that's right. They're all absolutely huge. A lot of them are wearing these incredibly huge, extravagant teardrop pearl earrings. They're, they're incredible. And there's one in particular where um, there's a, a painting called Women Holding a Balance. And she's not wearing any jewellery, but has several pearl necklaces sort of, sort of laid out. So they seem to be almost sort of cascading out of her jewellery chest or box or something. It, it is really, really yeah. incredible. He actually has a painting called young woman with a pearl necklace where she's sort of playing with her her ribbon around her neck but the very obvious focal point is this incredible sort of flicker of light that very subtly but beautifully picks up the pearl necklace and earring that she's wearing very much like what's going on with girl with the pearl earring it's just yeah it's just but amazing. Um, whether or not this is real or not he definitely did a really good job who they picked the pearls <laughs> <laughs> so actually Arts and Culture Google have an incredible six or seven page article on Vermeer's use of pearls in, in his paintings. And I'll link it in the show notes below just in case you're interested at all. But I would definitely encourage everyone to go and have a little Google and see how many pearls you can spot in Vermeer's paintings. It, it really is. It really is something symbolistic wise I mean art art's all about symbols and sort of subtle representations and sort of hidden meanings behind the canvas do you know of any sort of art historical meanings of portraying a, a peril yeah. and what it could mean for the sitter or the person so that um I think everyone probably all know this painting another really amazing painting is the birth of Venus Oh, yes, yes Botticelli. Exactly. I think that actually represents the beauty of Pearl so well because you have this most beautiful woman that come out from the show and that's the most incredible, beautiful, untouched woman in the world. And I think that's probably, you know, the, the best way to say about how beautiful the Pearls that really are. They are, they represent purity, innocence, just the kind of uh, natural beauty without any work. I think that's um something that's why you always see pearls like worn by different ladies, the most incredible woman in history and in different paintings, I think. It's just because of the beauty and because of the symbol of it. It's so interesting actually and when you when you think of that meaning of purity and innocence and you go back to look at Johannes Vermeer's Girl with the Pearl Earring, that is that just sums up exactly this young maid, what she's portraying, the, the innocence in her stare, the sort of curiosity, the the vulnerableness, the, the purity in, in her act of just, just sort of very lightly turning her head. It's really incredible. And that, the Botticelli Birth of Venus painting is so iconic as well. And it's so funny. I never would have associated her as a pearl coming out well, of that. That's so about interesting. He's describing the most beautiful art- woman um, in a world. He actually put her inside a big shell. That's a big statement. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's it's just incredible. And again, just to sort of re-emphasize this tiny little thing, this minute detail on a painting and the sort of the connotations and, and sort of hidden meanings behind it is, is quite incredible. And it's something that has continued to sort of follow perils, you know, their whole way through history, really. And even today, like we said, not particularly in our generation, seen as something that are particularly very popular or desirable when you think of something like diamonds or emeralds or you know things like that I don't think I know any of my friends that that would have ever said to me oh I would really love a pearl necklace (laughs) not to say that that won't change in, in any in any any time soon but pearls have made headlines our whole lives and particularly when specific pearls have hit auctions and there's two in particular that we're going to talk about just a very nice sort of link while we're talking about pearls. So the first is a pearl necklace that came to auction in 2011 that used to belong to Elizabeth Taylor. It's such an interesting story actually. Like I think everyone knows Elizabeth Taylor was a big fan, massive fan of jewellery and she was actually given a, a really lovely love gift by a partner 
reach her burton and that is that we see mm-hmm. the peregrina pearl and i think the story behind it was actually really interesting um it was actually discovered in 1530 it was so beautiful the slave who discovered it actually handed to his boss that's what happened originally and it was actually in Panama, and because it was so beautiful, it ended up become a gift um to King Philip the Second and of Spain. Really, yes. Oh wow! So it's really interesting. So this, well, people say that. So there's been there's a debate about it. But who? Yeah, King Philip the Second actually married Queen Mary the First later on. They got married quite young, and um, it became her bridal present. Um. So it was just really fascinating, his like the story and history behind this pearl. And you could actually see Mary the First of England wearing this beautiful, massive pearl as a brooch, uh, a piece of jewelry in one of the portraits that was you know depicting her. So obviously that's incredible. Anyway, long story short, um Queen Elizabeth the First end up um with this pearl and I think she probably decided to return this pearl to the Spanish Empire. Um so yeah, actually was returned back in 1558 um that's the the record some said mary tudor pearl isn't seen as peregrina but they actually look extremely similar so we just i mean we just don't know however this incredible peregrina pearl then ended for some reason after returning to the spanish empire he ended up in napoleon's brother who was the ruler of spain for five years and then he then returned to the french court with spanish crown jewels which is um a bit naughty <laughs> but this is what <laughs> happened he took peregrina pearl back to france and it was actually sold to duke of abercorn and it was given to his wife as okay. a as, again a, a love present and then um he actually remained in the family until 1969 when they decided they they're going to sell that um, okay. some of the incredible collection. So this pearl actually um, went on an auction at Sotheby's London in 1969 after being in the family for a long time. Richard Brunton at that time bought the pearl famously for a, a crazy, I think it was a crazy money at that time. It was $37,000 then. And I yes, Valentine's ticket. Exactly. For Elizabeth. It was so interesting, like she obviously she really loved that um pearl necklace or the the pearl pendant. She actually converted that into a necklace, and she's actually written a book. So her book is Elizabeth Taylor, My Love Affair with Jewelry. Yeah, you said there's a really great story. There's one day she realized she couldn't find the pearl necklace. She looked all over the place, couldn't find it, and she just thought she's just got to open um the puppy's mouth and. She then screamed because she saw that pearl lying inside his mouth. It was actually in quite a perfect condition, she <laughs> said. <laughs> so she had accidentally dropped it, and because it was it's so heavy, like uh, historically, the, the the Hamilton family that owned it previous to Elizabeth Taylor. There's also accounts of them having lost it in Buckingham Palace and in Windsor Castle because the, the pearl is just so heavy that it, it kept falling out of yeah. its um, setting. So essentially. That's exactly what's happened here. So she just dropped headed, accidentally yeah. and the dogs decided to, to uh, have a little shoot. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> anyway, in the end, after Elizabeth Taylor passed away, the pearl came out of auction. It was actually, I think it was around 2011. It went on Christie's. Yeah. And it sold for $11 million, which was a record breaking price. And now this pearl um, necklace has remained in private collection. Which is just incredible. And like you, like you mentioned there, when it was bought by Richard Burton, she actually went to Cartier and had Cartier redesign the necklace. And she also said it within, is it rubies or rubies or emeralds or something that she also, that she also yeah. incorporated into the necklace? We'll leave a link to an Liz Taylor wearing it. It is it's massive. quite something, isn't it? It's unbelievable. Like if you think of the blingiest bling and then times that by <laughs> 10, that doesn't even really touch the sides of Elizabeth wearing this. It's incredible. I, know, I feel it's so, like she's so the only lady who could actually put it on like this. Oh my goodness, absolutely. If you and I tried to wear this, it just wouldn't read in the same way that it does with her, but she just had this incredible elegance. Oh gosh, that's like we said, it's an incredible, incredible pearl necklace, but it's not the only pearl necklace that's made headlines. There's another pearl pendant, everyone was literally talking about it. If you go on Instagram, 
that something is all over the you know the Instagram page all the time. Um, it was actually Marie Antoinette's pill. Yeah, which is incredible. So Marie Antoinette, the famous queen that was beheaded during the French Revolution, massive um, fashion fan. She spent so much money on jewelry. This particular pearl pendant was so beautiful. It went on sale at Sotheby's auction house in Geneva, Switzerland, in November two thousand and eighteen. And I actually have the extract from the catalogue. So it's a little bit of provenance and background to essentially prove that this this necklace came from Marie Antoinette. In March 1791, King Louis XVI, Marie Antoinette and their children began to prepare their escape from France. According to accounts written by Marie Antoinette's lady-in-waiting, Madame Campan, the Queen spent an entire evening in the Tuileries Palace, wrapping all of her diamonds, rubies and pearls in cotton and placing them in a wooden chest. In the following days, her jewels were sent to Brussels, which was under the rule of the Queen's sister, Archduchess Marie Christie, and was home to the Count Mercy Argental. The Count, the former Austrian ambassador to Paris, was one of the only men who had retained the Queen's trust. It was he who took delivery of the jewels and sent them to Vienna and to the safekeeping of the Austrian emperor, Marie Antoinette's nephew. In 1792, the royal family was imprisoned in the Temple Tower. Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette were executed by guillotine in 1793 and their 10-year-old son, Louis XVII, died in captivity. The King and Queen's only surviving child, Mary Theresa de France, Madame de Royale, was released in December 1795 after three years of solitary confinement. After learning of the deaths of her mother and brother, she was sent to Austria. Upon her arrival in Vienna in 1796, she was given her mother's jewels by her cousin, the Emperor. Having borne no children of her own, Madame Royale bequeathed part of her jewellery collection to her niece and adoptive daughter, Louise of France, Duchess of Parma, and great-granddaughter of Charles X, King of France, who in turn left them to her son, Robert I, the last ruling Duke of Parma. And you have very kindly sent me a portrait of Princess Louise, Duchess of Parma, where she's wearing this incredible necklace um, given to her by the daughter of Marie Antoinette. And it's just this incredible story, really. And if I needed to escape France, I would—I don't think I would spend very much time ah. wrapping jewellery. I think it just shows Marie Antoinette's incredible sort of forward thinking that if she was exiled, she could maybe dismantle this jewellery and sell it for money for the family. I think it's really incredible that that's what she's... That was, in my opinion, that must have been her thinking. It wasn't, oh, we're going to escape <laughs> France. I'll, I'll send all my nice things ahead of time. I do think there was um, there was reason behind it, but I, I just think it's it's incredible. But anyway, we digress a little bit. So, like we said, this incredible. So it was a selection of jewelry, but this the sort of key piece of the evening actually was this incredible pearl necklace that has this really beautiful diamond and pearl sort yes. of droplet right in the centre of it. it. But it made headlines. So why did this necklace in particular I mean, it's such a, make headlines? It's such an incredible piece. Um, if you think about from the fact that. If a natural pearl with this kind of luster, with this kind of quality, this kind of size, and it once um it was once belonged to the last queen of France, Marie Antoinette. That's such an incredible story. It's also been done in such a beautiful way as well. You can see a beautiful um massive French bowl, and you have this pearl and dango down. So from a jewelry making point of view, you have the most incredible material and you have the most beautiful design and most importantly you actually have this bit of um, incredible provenance the history actually yeah the story you are literally wearing a piece of history it's just the most incredible necklace only second i think to elizabeth taylor's beautiful necklace that we spoke about a minute ago but it actually took the record that night for the most expensive yeah pearl ever sold yeah so um, um it was actually sold for 36 million dollars which is incredible roughly about 28 million pounds yeah it's an incredible amount of money for this piece and it, it now holds the record for the most expensive yeah at auction the the original estimate was actually one um million to two million dollars so you could just see how he actually went 10 times 40 times more well, there we are. The love affair with pearls continues to this day. Um, okay, perhaps not everyone can afford £36 million for pearls, but they are this incredibly interesting gemstone. And they've been something, you know, throughout history that have really sort of stood the test of time. And like you said, at one point, they were, they were more expensive than what diamonds were. And I think 
that just shows really oh, yeah. of, the, of their stance and, and their importance yeah. well yeah Chew, thank you so so much for coming on and talking about Charles the first pearl earring and um, sharing all your knowledge on that and the two amazing deals that we've spoken about and got one final question for you okay so this is the Joe's Art History podcast and I've asked all my guests this question so far why is art important? well I think um especially for I think for somebody who's like me so into jewelry um art is just so it's just such an incredible way to record what happened in the past so you know if you wouldn't have been if it wasn't Van Dyke's painting we wouldn't have known that King Charles I was uh, so into like his earring uh, you know we could see him wearing that from, from different portraits and if he wasn't somebody who's sitting there painting and recording everything you wouldn't have known what you have been like back then and why not everyone needs a bit of art yeah no totally I completely agree with you and that's so interesting I think you're the only person I think so far that I've spoken to that's that's kind of noted art as like an important recording device of times gone past it's so so true like like you said that you know we can trace it through all these paintings and and the history of it, and now nowadays we have photography and things yeah, like that. Yeah, so it is, it is it's definitely so a very interesting um, factor, especially when you are trying to do some research and then you look back and you can find different pieces from, you know, not just jewellery, you can find furniture or uh, different pieces, different items you're looking for essentially and find them from different paintings. So, I mean, it's quite interesting to think about from this perspective historically wise is you know pearls have always played a part I mean but yeah there's there's like such an incredible history uh, surrounding them actually and like there's a fun fact that I that I want to share actually about Cleopatra so um like an anecdote relating to pearls and Cleopatra so she actually in a bet with Mark Antony she said that she could host the most expensive dinner party essentially that ever happened and he was like right okay I'll take you on that bet and during dinner she beckoned a servant to bring her some vinegar and a glass and she had these incredible pearl earrings and she took one of the pearl earrings and dissolved oh it in, in the vinegar and oh. drank it and that's how that's how she won the bet which is just amazing it's just amazing and there's there's so much I mean we could literally sit here all day I mean I found this incredible article which I'll link below actually in the show notes and it's 16 fun facts about the history of pearls because Cartier, the flagship store, is well, this is in the article as well, the flagship store in, of Cartier in New York was actually, the building was bought by Cartier giving the previous owner's wife this natural pearl, which was worth millions and millions of dollars. So she, so in exchange for the retail space, which is now Cartier's that biggest store, incredible, he isn't it, gave them a pearl both. and that's how he bought the flagship. It's just amazing. Anyway, I won't, I won't, go on and on about it but yeah actually I want to thank you so much for coming on and being so generous with your time and your knowledge this has been such an interesting chat with you and I've really loved researching this because I'm, I'm not I'm not a gemologist like yourself and I don't really um I don't really know anything about the history of jewelry but I think this is just another great way of and another dimension of where art history can take you by by looking at things and you know, looking for the details beyond the canvas, like you said, with this pearl earring and, and sort of where that has, has led us down to. Because when we initially discussed this podcast, we were just going to talk about, you know, we we're going to have like a 10 minute chat about <sighs> this Charles the First earring and that would be it. And then it ended up, led us both down this rabbit hole where we're like, oh, we could talk yeah. about this. And oh my gosh, have you heard about this? It was just so exciting. My pleasure. And really it. So thank you so, so much. Uh, before you go, um, where can um, people so, find yes, you and uh, what you're up to? What I have been doing recently, ever since the lockdown actually, is to launch my own online jewellery business and people could actually find me on Instagram. So it is called Clark and Young Fine Jewellery, Clark with an E, uh, Clark and Young Fine Jewellery. And yeah, um, we have been, well, it's, well, this is actually what I believe actually, you know, jewellery should be timeless, should be sustainable and um, should be something really unique. Uh, and we really try to specialize in like unique special vintage or antique pieces that you can love forever you could uh, like Marie Antoinette you could pass down generations and because I think you know jewelry is so important it 
my King Charles the First. It's a way to represent yourself, um, your taste, your status, how you believe, what you believe, really. And this this is actually our aim. We want to supply people with that kind of belief. We have been buying really timeless, beautiful. Vintage and antique pieces, and we also have been working with some incredible artists for the limited、um, edition of art jewelry. That's something, again, something people should look at and really should. I、uh, just, I just feel that I really believe that jewelry has a different way of、um, expressing yourself. So, if you're not a gemstone person, you will be、uh, an arty person, one way or the other. So definitely, um, do check us out. Um, well, Yachu, thank you so so much. I've really loved this chat, and I feel like I've learned so much about the history of pearls and how they how they come about. They're these incredible things, and I definitely I'm going to look at them with a lot more admiration. And、yes. art can, like we said, art can lead you down so many paths, and you know there's a history within everything, and you just have to sort of look deep enough, and it will it, you'll find something that interests you. Thank you so much. Yeah, Jay. Thank you so so much. You've been fabulous. And there you have it, another episode of the Joe's Art History podcast. I just want to take this opportunity one more time to say thank you so much to Yachi for coming on the podcast and giving us such an interesting history on pearls. I have completely fallen in love with this little gem, and I really hope that you've learned a little something listening to this podcast. And again, as we said previously in the show, it's just a really great example of. Where art history can take you, and why it is so important, and all the different wonderful roads that it can lead you down, and it really does offer something for everybody. If you've enjoyed this episode, please make sure that you like, rate, and subscribe, which makes sure that you never miss another episode. And apparently, it also helps other listeners find the podcast. If you've enjoyed today's episode and think you might know someone that would be interested in listening, then please do feel free to pass on the podcast to them. I'd be very, very grateful if you can help me get the word out. If you'd like to get in touch about today's show and what you've heard, you can email me joesarthistory at gmail dot com, or you can contact me via Facebook at Joe's Art History, and you can find me on there. As stated, all images that were referred to during this podcast will be available to view on my website, www.joesarthistory.com. There will be links to my website in the show notes below, and they will also be available on my Instagram in my stories. And there'll be a link to my Instagram also in the show notes. There's also links to Clark and Yang Fine Antique Jewelry, the business that Yachu runs, and there's some really beautiful pieces on there. So I would highly recommend that you check them out and also follow them on Instagram. Finally, thank you so much for listening, and I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Joe's Art History Podcast. I look forward to welcoming you next time, and until then, keep learning and remember, art is for all.